uh, I founded Craig Laboratories um, several years ago while working on ways to use genetic engineering um, in application to the material sciences. I came up with some ideas on how to use our ability to manipulate DNA to change the mechanical properties of silk fibers by changing the DNA of silkworm. I read an article, a scientific article, that um, explained that Dr. Fraser here at the University of Notre Dame was part of the first international team which had proven the viability of certain gene splicing techniques to silkworm. So I approached Dr. Fraser, and within a few hours we had mapped out on a piece of paper on his desk exactly how to accomplish my goals. He'd showed me how we could take the gene sequences that I wanted to use, couple them with his gene splicing technology, and we had a good chance of achieving our objectives. When I set up the Craig Biocraft Laboratories, I didn't own any laboratories. And I frankly didn't have the financing to set up laboratories. But here at the university, they not only had the tools and the ability, but they had, they had brilliant people who I knew were at the absolute tops of their field. Um, so uh, once I formed a relationship with Dr. Frazier, I knew it was somebody I could work with. Um, I approached the university and um, I entered into a collaborative research um, and intellectual property agreement with the university, which essentially um, allowed Craig's, Craig Labs the right to finance the work in the laboratories. We paid for the, we paid for the work, we paid for the researchers. But the university applied its, its knowledge and its expertise, particularly through, through Dr. Frazier, and I brought also my um, concepts and ideas. And then shortly thereafter, we um, established the first silkworm colony here at um, the University of Notre Dame and began doing genetic engineering with silkworm along the lines that Dr. Frazier and I had mapped out. In broad terms, the power of genetic engineering, it's so powerful. We, humankind has only begun to tap, well, tap the future in terms of genetic engineering. Our vision at the beginning was to apply genetic engineering to the material sciences, a really new and revolutionary concept. And the progress we've been making here at Notre Dame, I think establishes that we've been on the right track from the beginning. What we laid out on those pieces of paper on Dr. Frazier's office all those years ago, his scribblings of the gene splicing techniques coupled with my ideas on, for the specific sequences and how we would use them, that has really played out very well here in the research labs at, at Notre Dame. They aren't, just, um, um, they aren't just playing here, they're doing serious science. But this is only just now being exposed to the public. Until now, it's been myself and a very small group of researchers who knew what we were doing and knew how close we were getting, every day, a little closer. And here's what's exciting and what I think many people don't understand about our technology. We were founded upon the concept of producing, reproducing in the silkworm, s spider silk polymers which already occur in nature, but there's no known way to obtain industrial scale production. That was the original concept. But as the company has grown, as we've seen our results in the laboratory, and what this manipulation of the, of the DNA sequences can do, that vision has expanded. It's now become very apparent to me and to the scientists on the team that that is really just the beginning. The potential is to incorporate many different types of designer proteins, incorporate them into the silk fibers, not only in ways to change the structural mechanical properties of the fiber, to increase strength, to increase um, flexibility, to um, increase resiliency, but to also add new unique properties. For example, um, injecting a DNA sequence that describes an um, antibiotic, so that the antibiotic is actually spun into silk fiber. Now think about what that, what the potential would that would give for sutures. Um, how about a um, expression of a protein that uh, reduces scarring? The potential is almost limitless. Not only now for um, changing the mechanics of the fiber, but to giving it new properties that were undreamed of when we first envisioned this project. This is a, almost a whole new door that we are at the University of Notre Dame and the researchers at the University of Wyoming have opened for the material sciences. Working with the University of Notre Dame has been absolutely fantastic. The University of Notre Dame is really on the cutting edge of this research in material sciences 
and in genetics. Uh, with talent like uh, Dr. Frazier, and he's just the head of the team here at, at the University of Notre Dame on this project. There are many other scientists. This has been uh, absolutely fabulous, and it's been a pleasure working with them. Uh, the University of Notre Dame absolutely deserves its credit, its reputation, and I can say this um, uh, from someone who's been in, in this laboratory. The University of Notre Dame absolutely deserves its credit as one of the top research, research institutions in this country. And I also, having said that, I have to say the talent at the University of Wyoming is also absolutely top notch. We have done an amazing amount of research in the last few years, and it has built to this uh, crescendo. But this is just the beginning. Uh, this, uh, and this may look like it's, it's been tremendous progress, and it has been. But we are just at the beginning of opening this door of using um, genetic engineering for the material sciences. We're looking at applications, uh, potential applications uh, in uh, medicine, in material sciences, in, uh, in textiles, and that's just, that's just the beginning. I'd like to say thank you. Our investors have been very patient. There have been long periods of time where they haven't heard anything from the, from the lab because we've been working on something that had to stay quiet in the laboratory. And when we've had to stay quiet, we've stayed quiet. It's very difficult for a stockholder to sit back and, and hold on to his shares when he doesn't hear anything from the company. But I can assure our shareholders and our founding shareholders certainly know when the company's been quiet, it's been for very good reasons.